Ladies and gentlemen, and uh, those of you in the corridors that would like to join the plenary, could you please mo move forward and uh, try to find your seats so that we can uh, start uh, going? Uh, as always, you know, the time is, the time is going to run out, and uh, we don't want to steal too much of the time from the upcoming plenary either. Then firstly, a word of warning. I'm economist by education. I'm ecolog ecologist by heart, and uh, I'm politician in everyday life. So whatever you take as good or bad. But let's say that I know the virtues, but the vices also about the, the profession of uh, economists and uh, the education of economists. And uh, uh, let me start with uh, the fact why I got a bit frustrated ages ago when I studied it. Economics is not physics. It's not mathematics. And it's not natural science where one plus one can all, all, only and always be two, and where if you prefer A to B, you always prefer A to C. And this is what the whole profession, right, actually is trying to do. Wanna be natural science. This is the truth. But, uh, well, it's a problem. But what is our problem is that all the politicians are take it like a natural science. They listen, the economists, the ministers of the finance and economics. What is the GDP? Are we growing? How much debt do we have? Oh, gosh. Now we need to save. Now we can't spend. And it blissfully unaware of millions of things, just to mention how this kind of a gendered worldview reflects on economics. It's always the puppy that comes uh, with the money to house, and it's mama that spends the money, right? Look the amount of guys in trade, agriculture, finance, and the women in education, ministries, social, and environment. Have you noticed that always when you put the money on cement, iron, and asphalt, no matter what, it's an investment. And you never talk about care economy. You need to care the roads, and that the roads are expenditure because they cost so much. But guess what? What happens when you educate people and you take care of ill people and uh, uh, people with mental stress and try to patch them? It is expenditure that we cannot afford if the GDP doesn't go up and so forth. So actually the whole information and analytics is going in dreadfully wrong direction. And we know it, and still we don't know how to, uh, how to act and what to do. And uh, another small example, going to nature. You know, discounting system, how you can sort of uh, uh, predict future, uh, future values, let's say, for example, in investments, by, with the formula uh, have, uh, having this today's value uh, um, the, uh, to, to, to be uh, seen in the future. And always oil and coal that has been very profitable in the future. It's the past performance. It gives high figures. So it's a good investment. But what about solar power, wind, a lot of sustainable investments who do not have the track record. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, risky business. Oil, no, 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 no. You know it's profitable. 
And this actually encourages the oil and fossil companies to go on after new wells and reservations, even though they might be thinking they can't even open them, because it adds the value, the assets on the balance sheet. And it's just the formula done by someone and used by many. And so what are we doing today? We are dwelling in economics. It's economic stupid, as said. And this time the mirror is showing to us economics, e economists. What is the power of economic models on decision making and society at large? Whom do we li uh, listen? Who counts what counts? And what would we need to do together to change the models, man-made, woman-changed? <laughs> and how, indeed, because I do believe in economics, this approximation of the economy could actually serve us as human beings and societies. So wholeheartedly welcome. Please join now. Please join with your comments and questions and keep on coming together with us in this network also in the future. Then, uh, to start with, um, we do not have on, on, on place uh, Paolo uh, Gentiloni, who is the European Commission for Economy, and actually could have had very good intervention and maybe comments on this, but while he couldn't be present, he has a video recording for us. And then after that, we directly moved to uh, Anne Petitfort. Very happy to have you with us and to, to hear your intervention. Please, the Kentiloni. Dear Chair, honorable members, distinguished guests, uh, let me first thank the organizers for this cross party initiative. Keynes once wrote that the ideas of economists and political philosophers are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, he wrote, the world is ruled by little else. So this session on the power of economic models is definitely appropriate. I think we can all agree that an economy based on an ever-increasing use of limited resources that produces even more waste and emissions is not a sustainable model. Nor can a model that perpetuates inequalities be viable in the long run. Understandably, in recent years, dissatisfaction with an economic system that increases disparities and threatens our planet has grown. And this discontent also extends to the way we measure progress or growth, notably GDP. We all recognize that GDP as an indicator has its limits. Indeed, in the first article I published as commissioner, even before the pandemic hit, I called for a new sustainable growth strategy and for integrating a broader set of indicators into our assessment of how member states are performing. But I want to be clear that the alternative to a traditional growth model cannot be a degrowth model. A shrinking economy will have fewer, not more, resources to invest in environmental protection, in healthcare, education, infrastructure and the likes. Economic growth remains an essential engine for positive change. That is why the shift in paradigm that the Commission has embraced is towards sustainable growth, 
that does not come at the expense of the environment, nor at the expense of the weakest in our societies. This paradigm shift is what the European Green Deal is all about. It's about transforming the European economy and moving to a different growth model, one powered by carbon-free electricity and renewables and based on circularity principles, reuse and recycling. It's about lifting our growth and making sure that the fruits of that growth are shared more widely, also by investing in new and more advanced skills. Our approach to sustainable growth is a holistic one. For example, the European semester, our cycle of economic policy coordination, focuses on the economic, environmental and social dimensions of sustainability. The same approach has guided our economic response to the pandemic and to Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine first with next generation EU, and then with Repower EU. And there is widespread support for it. Over 80% of citizens agree that the EU should invest massively in renewable energies and increasing the energy efficiency of buildings, transport and goods, according to the latest EU barometer survey. At the same time, Many citizens are concerned about the cost of the transition, a worry compounded by high inflation and record energy prices in the wake of Russia's full-scale invasion last year. And this is where evidence-based policy design comes in. The Commission uses a range of economic models to assess and compare policy options and their distributional effects. Our models look at the impact of regulations and emissions pricing and the benefits of using the revenues to ease the social impact of the transition or boost green technology. But further efforts are needed to be able to quantify the impacts of economic activity on all natural assets and the consequences of their degradation for the economic possibilities of our children and grandchildren. At EU level, there has been a lot of progress in this field. For instance, Eurostat has developed several new indicators that measure what matters, such as CO2 emissions and income inequality. Every year, Eurostat publishes a report on how each member state is performing on the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Commission has been working on integrating these new indicators, as well as the SDGs, into the European semester. And this July, the EU will, for the first time, present a voluntary review on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda at the high-level political forum in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, building an economy that works for the people and the planet is a formidable challenge, but one we cannot shy away from. Integrated environmental and economic models can guide us in this difficult task. And the regular dialogue with all the stakeholders involved is essential. So I am confident that together we can successfully shift to a new model of growth that is both sustained and sustainable, and show that economic growth can indeed must be a force for good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Here we heard the uh, message by our uh, Commissioner for Economy. And what do you think? Uh, shall we raise the bar? Uh, 
And it is my great pleasure to give the floor to Anne Petitfort, Director of Prime Policy Research in Macroeconomics. Please, the floor is yours. So I want to begin, as everybody has, uh, by thanking Philippe Lambert and his team and the 20 MEPs that have made this possible. Uh, we, you know, we're so impressed by the level of the organisation and, and the care that you've taken over this. But I also want to say, and this is probably not as popular, that I want to say thank you to President Ursula von der Leyen for the generosity of her hosting this event, of the Commission hosting this event. I've only heard criticisms of her speech, but I thought her speech was an incredibly important one. And we on the green side of the political spectrum need to be careful. We don't have enough friends, right? That's our problem. That's what we have to fix. So we can't avoid, we cannot, we shouldn't, uh, uh, you know, alienate those people that are coming towards us. Right, so we've spent these days basking. Thank you. We've spent these days basking in consensus. We all agree on the need for sufficiency, not efficiency, on equity, especially for the South, on well being, on regenerative, uh, a, a regenerative economy, the donut economy, a circular economy. We have agreed on all of that. We feel very happy with ourselves because we're all cheering each other on, right? But there has been no discussion of a strategy for challenging power. So there are two sites of power that should concern us. The first one is the fossil interest, and that's a site that we're already at. We're at the barricades in front of the fossil interest, and we're throwing stones at them, we're shouting at them, we're booing at them, right? But there is another site of power, and that is the money interest, and we are nowhere near it. So they have erected barricades against us. They have protected themselves from any democratic accountability, from democratic regulatory oversight. They are now behind the barriers, and we are not even challenging them. We're not even where the real power is. And they have something which is extraordinary. It's like a giant tap. It's like a giant spigot or a gas pump at a petrol station. And that pumps out easy, deregulated money, and most of it is aimed at the fossil interest. So we need to switch off that big spigot, that enormous pump. We have to switch it off because it's easy money, which means it's deregulated credit and uh, it's out of control. It is the thing that is fueling fossil, uh, fossil fuel investment and greenhouse gas emissions. Secondly, we need to m focus on monetary policy, not fall into the trap set by the money interest who want us to ex focus exclusively on fiscal policy. We need to challenge the power of the money interest. We need to understand the global economic model that they operate. We call it capitalism without breaks, powered by infinite supplies of easy money, of credit. But it, there's another aspect to that model, which is that it's export-oriented. All of our economies in Europe are oriented towards the global economy, towards exports. And the domestic economy at home is neglected. Now, who's engaged in the export uh, sector? The 1%, the big corporations. Our, the model of our economies is to do everything to suit their interests, right? So what, what it does is to boost the income of the 1%, that model, 
but at the same time, simultaneously, it depresses the wages, the incomes of the 99%. Now, the rich, the rich don't spend all their money. Elon Musk, you know, can buy the odd rocket to go into outer space, but really, he doesn't know what to do with all his money, and he doesn't spend it. He doesn't use it to buy the things the economy produces. The poor, the 99%, spend all of their income, but in fact their income is shrinking. And you can see they struggle to pay for a roof over their heads, to pay for decent health, to pay for dentistry in my country, right? To pay for their kids to go to university. All of these things are now becoming beyond their reach. They can't they can't, they can't purchase all that the economy produces. So then we have this extraordinary thing where they don't use their purchasing power to, produce what is, uh, to buy what is produced. The result is the opposite of what much green commentary is about. It's a crisis of overproduction on the one hand and underconsumption on the other. And I, I want to say that so far from purchasing power chasing too few goods and services, which is what the mainstream would ha have us think, we have too many goods and services chasing too little purchasing power. And you can see it on any high street when those pound shops come and you see all of those Chinese goods dumped in shops. We, we have gluts. We have surpluses. We're producing too much, and this, of course, has a massive ecological impact. But when the Green Movement, we tend to focus on consumption, and we tend to focus in particular on the consumption of the 99%, and we leave alone the 1%. I want us to change that focus. So the thing is that when people cannot afford to maintain their living standards, to pay for a roof over their heads, to pay for education or whatever, what do they do? They borrow money. And when firms can't meet their sales targets, what do they do? They borrow money too. And so we have this crisis of overproduction, huge amounts of debt, and easy money, right? And low incomes, falling real incomes across the board, in the United States, in Europe, in China. China's repressing in incomes in exactly the same way as the Germans have been doing since the Hartz reforms. Right. So this place, we know that this mixture of overproduction, debt, and falling incomes leads to global financial crises. So the question now becomes, when is the next one? That's all. And if you can get the timing right, you can make a lot of money. I'm never good at getting the timing right. So, what lesson does this provide for the Green Movement? We must stop attacking the, the 99%, if you like, the majority, the people who are actually suffering under this model, this economic model. They're turning to the far right, because as Polanyi argued, you know, what they can see is that the market, the market is stripping them of all that's important to them, and so they're looking, and they've been told that, uh, sorry, the government can't do anything, because the market says that they must pay for this and they must pay for that and that the price is up and so on. The market decides the price of grain. The market decides, the invisible hand of the market decides the price of oil. And if the market fancies speculating on the price of oil, it so does and it makes us pay, right? And what happens is the 99% say, we want to be protected from this market and they turn to a strong man. It's variably a strong man. In Italy, it's a strong woman. Please protect us from these markets. What is the left saying? What is the progressive side of the spectrum saying? What they're saying is, this is the model. So we must, we must stop attacking the 99%. We must attack the 1% for excess production by way of excess easy money. As Philip said last night at our gathering, this is a fight. This is a struggle. This is war. And the challenge we face is this. How do we mobilize the 99% to fight this war, to break down the barricades erected by the 1%? That's what I want to discuss, instead of everything that we agree on. And the first step, in my mind, we can take is this. 
shine a very bright light on the finance sector, on the 1 per cent. Secondly, educate ourselves. This is not rocket science. I can tell you if I understand it, you'll understand it. Right. Thirdly, understand that the 1% is represented by Wall Street, Frankfurt and the City of London. And that they would be nowhere without the taxpayer-backed public infrastructure which supports their money-making, their, their speculation, their capital gains. Right? They need the central bank, and the central bank is only there because behind it are millions. I don't know how many million taxpayers there are in Europe. There's only 30 million in Britain. But without 30 million taxpayers paying their taxes every year, every month, every day, there wouldn't be the revenues that the finance sector gets from the bonds that it buys as collateral. Right? This is public infrastructure. This is our money. This is our power. We have to recognize that this is our power. We have to recognize that government bonds, the debt, which you know the, the right would have us believe is some kind of evil thing, is actually something that the finance sector cannot wait to get its hands on. There was a crisis under the Clinton administration when Clinton decided he was going to have a budget surplus. That, left to, that led to a shortage of bonds on Wall Street. And, and the private Wall Street nearly collapsed under the strain because it needs that collateral to be the collateral it gets to, uh, to leverage additional money in the shadow banking sector beyond uh, democratic regulation. So we need to understand that we have power and we have to take that power and we have to use it to dismantle the power exercised by the 1%. We need to acknowledge and deploy the power that is embedded in our public tax-funded institutions. We need to mobilize public opinion and build political power. I'm not impressed with booing politicians who are here because they're elected to represent our communities, our societies, and our governments. They're doing their job, right? We have to mobilize those people so that we get different politicians. And if, the, if we've got the wrong politicians, that's our problem. We've got to address it. <laughs> finally, finally, the thing we just absolutely have to do is to blow up the easy money pipeline. Thank you. Well, Anne, you uh, certainly blew it up and uh, gave the whole uh, uh, audience a, a really strong spirit. So thank you for, for that. Next, uh, we will uh, have uh, Gail Giraud, Professor Director uh, of uh, Research from CNRS. And again, he's um, from the video. So. Giro, welcome, and now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I would like to thank as well Philippe Lamberts for this marvelous event and Anne Petit for her very inspiring speech. So I don't know whether you can see my slides. Yes, we do. Okay, can you see them? Yeah, okay, good. So next slide. I'm going to try first, in the first part, very quickly to explain to you how some models lead to wrong policies. This would be a little bit technical, but please bear with me. Second part, and it's a little bit more subtle, wait a minute, or first slide, the flight slide before. Second part, I will try to explain how some assumptions, in a very subtle way, already encapsulate, at least implicitly, some policies. So we are prisoners of these assumptions, and therefore we are prisoners of these policies. And if we don't change the assumptions themselves, we won't be able to change the policies. And I will go back to how to blow up the, the easy money pipeline that Anne Petit for just described. And third part, I will try to show you that there exist alternative models. They are not perfect, because there is no such thing as a perfect model, but they are much better than the mainstream models that are used by almost everybody on this planet today. Next slide. 
So first of all, in 2016, there was a big, you know, a big crisis within the profession of macroeconomists where you had some people like Paul Romer, who back then was the chief economist of the World Bank and who would receive his Nobel Award just a few years later, who wrote a paper just saying, you know, macroeconomic theory is no longer in science. Next slide. Then you had also a paper by Olivier Blanchard. He was then the chief economist of the IMF. And he said essentially, you know, um, the assumptions that we use in our models are essentially profoundly at odds with everything we know about reality. Um, the way we calibrate our model is non-convincing. The normative implications of, of our model are not convincing. And our DSG model, which back then was the kind of, you know, the top of the frontier of the research in macroeconomics, our DSG models are completely flawed. Next slide. So here is an illustration of how this works. You have the, the, gray, the, the black curve is the GDP of Greece uh, just before the big crisis uh, of the Greek debt, uh, public debt. And the curves around the, the, the trajectory are the forecast of the Troika, that is of the IMF, the European Commission, and the ECB. And as you can see, each year, the Troika was deeply wrong, just anticipating that the Greek GDP would go back to its previous value. And each year, the, the ECB and, the, and you know, the European Commission and the IMF could not even learn from its past mistakes. Why? Because they use models which are at equilibrium. And so if you use an equilibrium model, of course you will say, well, there is a small problem, it's a small external shock. But don't worry, the Greek GDP will go back to its previous value, which is supposedly, allegedly, its equilibrium value. And the consequence of that is that after that, of course, you can impose a very harsh austerity program because you believe that no matter what, <clears throat> the Greek GDP will go back to its equilibrium value. What is completely wrong here is the very idea that our economy is at equilibrium. The truth is that it's not and that we need out of equilibrium models. Next slide. Here is another example of big mistakes that we make when we try to forecast. So the rate curve is the price of oil at the world level, which is probably the most important commodity today in the world economy. And the, the, the colored lines are the forecasts of the International Energy Agency in Paris. And as you can see, again, each year, the IEA is deeply wrong in its forecast. Why? Because most often, the IEA just expects that the price of oil will follow the linear extension of its past. And so what we see here is that not only are our economies not at equilibrium, but the dynamics of our economy is not linear, even in the short run. We cannot just expect that tomorrow will be the linear expense extension of yesterday. We have to think about the non-linear dynamics of our economies. Next slide. Here is another example which is also very, very troublesome. The, the rate curve is the level of inflation, uh, the core, I mean the CPI for the US, uh, during and after the, the global financial crisis of 2007. And the blue curve is the quantity of money created by the Federal Reserve. So that's the, the, the pipeline of easy money that Anne Petit Four was alluding to earlier. And as you can see, you have the different phases of the quantitative easing period number one, then QE2, then QE3, meaning that the central bank in the US has created billions and billions of money just to save the banks. And then many people would, would, would argue that this would have led to a huge inflation and the rate curve is just a level of prices showing that there was no inflation at all. So the mantra of a number of models which says that if you just print money, this will create inflation is just wrong. We have a counterexample here. And if this is wrong, this means that we have to change completely our models because 99.9% .9 of the models used by big institutions like the IMF, the ECB, the World Bank, etc., just assume that if you increase the quantity of money circulating in the economy, you will just have inflation. And we know this is just not true. This means that we need models that can incorporate the true impact of printing money. Next slide. Here is another example, which is um, the, the rate curve is the public debt of the US before, during, and after the great financial crisis, the global financial crisis. As you see, obviously, the US debt has increased tremendously, and yet the blue curve is the spread that is a measure of the riskiness of the public debt of the US assessed by financial markets. 
And as you may know, and this was alluded to by Anne Petit for earlier, the bonds, the treasury bonds, are used as collaterals pretty much everywhere within the financial sphere. So the price of US treasury bonds is absolutely key for the entire planet. And as you can see, the riskiness of the public debt as it has been assessed by financial markets has shrunk, has reduced during the same period. Instead of saying, oh, the public debt is increasing, therefore it's more dangerous to purchase public debt in the US, the financial markets have said, oh, no, 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 the situation is very risky, so let's, let's go back to what is secure, which is US treasury bonds. And so our models, when they claim that more public debt means more riskiness, means a higher interest rate, for instance, paid by the state, they are just wrong. Next slide. So now going back to climate, when we try as economists to couple macroeconomics and climate, then we have to face a big problem, which is how to assess the impact of global warming. And for that purpose, we use what, we, what is called the damage function. Probably the most famous damage function is the one introduced by Bill Nordhaus, who got the Nobel Award. And it's the blue curve here in this graph. So the x-axis is the increase of temperature, and the y-axis is the fraction of the world GDP that would be lost if we were to experience this increase of temperature. According to Bill Nordhaus' damage function, if we had an increase of global warming, let's say at the end of this century, of plus 6 degrees Celsius, then we would experience only a loss of 10% of the world real GDP, which honestly is completely ludicrous. Uh, and yet you have many people, many economists and many also politicians following Bill Nordhaus and saying, well, you know, global warming is not that dangerous because it will lead at most to minus 10% of the world GDP, which is not, you know, the end of, the, of history. Fortunately, there are alternatives, the one by Weizmann and the one by Dietz and Stern, which claim respectively that plus 6 degrees will lead to minus 50% of the world GDP and the other one minus 90%. And of course, whether you believe that Dietz and Stern are right or no doubt is right, you will end up with completely different conclusions and you will, of course, uh, advise for completely different public policies. Next slide. Another point which is also absolutely key is why did we economists not understand the key role played by energy in our economy? If we have a power blackout like in India or in Texas or in California, then of course the entire economy is completely stopped. But this you will never see in a model, in an economic mainstream model. Why? Because most of these models are built on the assumption that the role played by the, by the energy in our economy can be assessed, can be measured, thanks to the cost of energy in GDP. This is the so-called cost share theorem. And this cost turns out to be low as long as the price of energy is low. For instance, in the US, it has only been something like 8% of the, of the US GDP during a long period of time. And therefore, many economists would argue during this period that, well, energy, you know, is not a big deal because it costs only 8% of the, of the GDP. And therefore, if we lose it, it's not a big deal, which, of course, is completely wrong. So we have to understand the key role played by energy and, of course, by fossil fuels in the dynamics of our economy if we want just to be able to think about the transition towards renewable energies. Next slide. And the last point I want to mention uh, immediately is the so-called uncovered rate parity, which is a famous theory used by mainstream models to try to understand the dynamics of exchange rates. And here, what you see, it's a bit fuzzy, it's a bit chaotic, it's the distance with respect to what theory would, would, would forecast, and the distance between what the theory would forecast and what you empirically observe. And as you see, there is a big distance, whatever being the kind of currency that you're looking at. In other words, we have no way today within our mainstream economic models to understand the dynamics of exchange rates. And then this raises a big question. Why do we have flexible exchange rates if we don't understand how they move? Next slide. Another point also very important is the role of money. And this goes back to Anne's um, pipeline of easy money. In most mainstream models, there is simply no money. Why? Because money is assumed to be neutral in the sense that if you just multiply by two the quantity of money circulating in the economy, you just multiply by two the level of prices according to these models. And of course, this is completely wrong. It's not true. And briefly speaking, we know that, mo that money is non-neutral. On top of that, in most of these models, there is no bank. 
Why? Because most of these models, like the Diamond Divic model, they simply assume that a bank is only a financial intermediary entity, which borrows from the left hand the, the money that it lends from the, the right hand. Of course, this is not true. In real life, every day a bank creates money, ex nihilo. That's the job of a bank, a private bank. And so if we don't understand this, of course we cannot understand the role played by banks in our economy, we cannot understand how to finance the ecological transition, and we cannot understand how the fragility of our banks just threaten today our entire economy. Next slide. So in reality, money is neutral, the money creation is endogenous, and, and money creation is not necessary, inflationary, and what is behind all this is the main idea that in most of these mainstream models, saving leads to inflation, to, sorry, to investment. And that's why most of these models would say we have to take care of the capitalists or the wealthy people because they are saving money. Uh, and this money that is saved by them is used in order to finance investment. This is again completely wrong. We know today that it's exactly the opposite. Investment finance savings. In other words, it's because there is a demand for commodities, for services, and therefore because there are entrepreneurs who borrow money in order to finance investment, that wealthy people can save money, not the other way. And as long as we have the idea, the postulate, the axiom that savings leads to investment, this will lead to completely wrong public policies, which will systematically favor the saviors. I mean, those who can save money, that is, actually who are benefiting from the work that we are doing, the investment that we are doing, our labor and our efforts. So, and we will, the 99%, we will be completely neglected. Next slide. So, for instance, the, the, the excellent Russo Institute, which is a French think tank, published a report two years ago showing that if you scrutinize the first 11 commercial banks of the Eurozone, you will see that they have on the balance sheet a number of fossil fuel assets, which represent on average 95% of their equity. In other words, if tomorrow morning we were to be very bold and we decided that fossil fuels are stranded assets, then all of these banks would be bankrupt. And therefore, they can threaten today politicians by saying, oh, you want to go too fast in the direction of the uh, ecological transition. If you do that, we are going to go bankrupt and you will have to save us. And we all know that most states just cannot save big mega systemic banks. And therefore, that's one of the reasons, and I believe that's the main reason why we go so slowly in the direction of the transition, of the ecological transition that we need to put into practice. And therefore, if we want to win the war that Anne was alluding to, we definitely need to find a way to get rid of the fossil fuel assets which are on the balance sheet of the banks. Next slide. So I will go directly to the next slide because time is running. Uh, second part, it's more subtle, so I will go very fast. Next slide. There is, there is a, an academic debate about the short run Phillips curve. This Phillips curve says that um, the, the increase of pay of wages is a function of unemployment. If there is a lot of unemployment, it's much easier for employers to refuse to increase wages because they will tell you, well, you know, if you are, not, if you are unhappy with your, your payroll today, I mean, there are many people who want to take your job. And so for almost 30 years today, there is a big academic battle against the short run Philip curves, where you have a number of microeconomists claiming that it simply does not exist. In, re in reality, if you scrutinize the data, you will see that it exists. And the reason I believe that we have this debate, it's because it's a way to hide the fact that we have made the choice of unemployment 30 years ago in Europe by saying that inflation was the big enemy we have implicitly said we want to favor unemployment. But in order for this not to be completely obvious, we at the same time, we also said, oh, you know, there is no relationship between wages, inflation, and unemployment. This is just, you know, an old fairy tale from the Keynesians in the old time. It does no longer, it does no longer exist today. And in reality, we have made the choice of unemployment, which is a very bad public, public, public policy choice, but we have hidden it behind wrong uh, theory and behind wrong models. Next slide. Another point also is inequality, of course. Um, so this is a very famous curve, you know, it's the elephant curve, so I will go back immediately to the next slide, which is Branko Milanovic's very famous curve, which tells you that if you look at the, the, the growth 
of wealth in the past 20 or 25 years or so, essentially those who are at the trunk of the, um, the elephant, that is the, the far right, the 1%, they have benefited a lot. But also, you know, some people would say, well, you know, look at the head of the elephant. And so it's not so bad for the middle class. It's not so bad also for the poor. So this was essentially the message conveyed by, by Branko Milanovic. Now, it happens that there is a bunch of other economists, next slide, who have redone the calculations with the same data, I mean, slightly different data, sorry, and they have ended up with another uh, animal, which is the Loch Ness Monster, completely different. And therefore, if you believe that they are right, the conclusion is completely different. Everybody have been, has been screwed up by the globalization of the last 30 years, except the 1%. There is no such thing as, you know, part of the middle class has also benefited from globalization. And of course, if you believe that we should use data in the way it is, they have been used by Branko Milanovic, you will end up with a certain type of macro policy, a public policy, while if you believe that the second group of economists is right, then you will end up with completely different public policy and you will say, well, we definitely have to redistribute wealth from the richest and wealthiest to the poorest. Next slide. So, also a number of very technical questions, but I think they are key. There are debates about should we use the national income or the GDP? So, at first glance, you would say, well, that's a, you know, a Byzantine problem. Actually, it's not, because GDP is based on the idea that investment field feeds savings, while the national income category is based on the idea that savings feed uh, investment. And so you see that behind this apparently innocuous methodological debate, there is a huge political question, which is, should we favor the wealthiest who can accumulate wealth thanks to our labor, or should we favor those who work and create value? Another point is, is capital labor elasticity of substitution positive, bigger than one, smaller than one? The truth is, must probably be between zero and one, but this also has a huge consequence in terms of public policy. If you believe that it's bigger than one, you will say, you know, it's very easy to substitute capital to labor, and therefore, labor should just, should just adjust to, to uh, machineries, AI, and all this. And therefore, you will say, you know, you have no alternative, but you have to just adapt to the situation, because otherwise we will replace you by machines, which is not true, actually, if you understand that capital labor elasticity of substitution is below one. Third, does capital exist? The question, the answer is no. This is an old debate from the 70s, um, the Cambridge controversy. And if you understand this, you will understand that we definitely need to understand our economy as being based on several entities, you know, industrial capital, financial capital, um, social capital, etc., etc. The capital as such does not exist. Fourth, Dan, sorry, uh, I need to rush you up because we. Uh, we run out of the time, so could okay. you... Okay, can you give me just one minute to conclude? Yes, yes, please. So, so if you can just go to the last slides, um, not the, 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 last, the one before the last. There are a number of alternatives to these, to these very wrong models, um, which are based essentially on the assumption of stock flow consistency. That is, you say, well, we know that an economy is not at equilibrium. We know that the dynamics should not be linear, is not linear. And we should just take care of the fact that stocks today are just the, the, the output of the dynamics of the trajectories in the past. If you keep all this in mind, and if you base your model on material flow analysis, that is you say, well, energy matters, matter matters, money matters, then you can end up with much better models. We are constructing them today at Georgetown University with a number of other colleagues from the entire planet. And I hope that they one day will replace the very bad models that are used today in order to foster very wrong public policies. Thank you. A big hand uh, for you, Gail. Uh, I think that uh, this uh, critical thinking about economics should be uh, taught to all kids, uh, boys and girls, just uh, after they've learned uh, to read and write. So best success to your uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, endeavors. But let's move um, because of the time limits and our next speaker, Valentina Bosetti. Professor from Bocconi University, please. Okay, 
uh, I want first of all to thank the organizer. This is possibly the most rock concert type uh, conference I've ever been. So that's why we academics are kind of uh, you know shaky because we're not used to this. Uh, second, I want to uh, sort of build on what has been said in the pre previous presentation and try to be a little more uh, optimistic. Uh, I trained as an environmental scientist. Then I thought uh, I would not matter in the world, so I trained as an economist. Then I realized economists would never accept Team accept me, so I did a PhD in mathematics, so now they can sh and accept me. And I'm a modeler. So what I build are models, and I don't care, and I don't have a part, and I'm okay with many economics models. I take whatever works with other components, though so I'm not married to any, by constitution, I'm not married to any discipline, and so I don't hate economics. I think economics has very good things to teach us. So uh, what are these models that have been working on and actually are there since the 70s? And so much work uh, has come out of these models and then been you know, known because it's part of the IPCC. I guess all of you know what the IPCC is. Then the working group three leads with mitigations. Uh, with mitigation, the models in working group threes are, are not climate models. Those are economic models with additional components. The beauty of these models is that they are called integrated assessment models. They, within this name, you have so many different types from general equilibrium uh, to uh, you know, partial equilibrium, to system dynamics model, to simulation models, so to nonlinear models. Everything goes because the problem is important. It's not, not a single model that we should marry, but it's the best, mo the best model for the specific pro problem that I have at hand. And the thing that we've done as a discipline is to start to work with many models, many groups, and then sit together and say, okay, I have this assumption, you have this different assumption, let's try to mimic the same problem, and let's debate about the differences in our results. That's the way we build a community which is uh, you know which is uh, the community I'm part of and the community the results of which you see in the IPCC so I want to tell you three things about this community the first I want you to say a few few more things about these models the second I want to show you some of the results that come out of this model and the third is a surprise so what these models are, otherwise you sleep what these models are um, these models are you know some of them the fact that they are integrated means that they, together with the economy, economic activities, they also model the consequences for the environment. It could be the water, the oceans, it could be the air, the atmosphere, it could be the land and the biosphere, or it could be biodiversity. The idea is that these various elements are um, you know, brought together in the same uh, in the same system, in the same by the same by a group of people that work together, and the idea is that the feedbacks may go in both directions. So economic activities might have effect on the environment, but the true is also for the opposite direction. So we want to understand what a changed environment might imply for our productivity, labor productivity, capital productivity, infrastructure. Uh, um, reliability, etc. So these models were born in the 70s, and then for a long time they were mostly funded in parts of Europe and uh, the U.S. But then, um, you know, more recently, Europe has really been pushing a lot of money into the creation of these models, with the second important ancillary benefit, uh, pushing also for. Um, our community to involve national modeling teams. Why? Because every a government likes to have a model that has been you know, built by their own people. I, it, it seems crazy, but the same thing is happening for climate uh, science models. Each country wants to have, to have their own. They don't want to be told what is going to happen to the climate uh, by other, by U.S. models or by European models. Each country wants to have their own. So. Yeah, the, 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 those are not my slides. My slides are only, you know, yes, these are my slides. So, but it's okay. I mean, you can enjoy what, reading both. So the, it's a very beautiful graphic, but I didn't do that. So, <laughs> so what are, what are the, 
you know, so first of all, I want us to be proud of the fact that the, the Europe has really been funding this community, these models, uh, that uh, has then spread across the planet and really uh, created a community that is now a global community. The second is that the results coming from this model have really been meaningful for policy making. An example is here. What you see in this IPCC uh, figure is uh, something as important as uh, the time we should reach net zero emission okay, to be able to reach a specific climate uh, goal. For example, if you move to the left of the graph, you have more stringent climate goal. If you move to the right, you have less stringent climate goals. Now, who's producing those scenarios, many, many scenarios that are used to define the timing of net zero are these models. Okay, so models that incorporate the economy, our activities, our productivity, what we produce, and the emissions that those activities produce, and that also model how we can change economic activities, how we can change the way we produce energy to reduce our emissions. The second set of results they produce is these beautiful rainbow graphs where we can see or imagine future way our energy system might work if we have different climate objective, objectives in mind. So to the comment made before that uh, you know, forecasts tend to be wrong when you actually get to the time for, the, for when the forecast was made, I want to tell you this. It's very hard to be a modeler and project for 2030, 2050. Okay, you can be wrong in so many ways. But the point is that by producing these graphs, you start to ask yourself a question. A big important question that we realized was, a big important problem we realized was that by postponing mitigation and, for example, believing that we would do more negative emissions later, we were putting at risk the biodiversity and the forests of the planet. So some of the trade-offs can only appear if you do runs. Maybe they are wrong, but maybe, but still, they might show you a trade-off that is there and real and important to take into account in your policy making. So what was the third thing that I wanted to tell you? Models are not just important because of the results they produce. Sometimes these results are wrong, as I said. The importance of models is that when you start to work together, economists, with people expert in air pollution, with people that are expert in biodiversity, you start to create a new language that is the language that you need to create a narrative, a story. The story is as important as the results because the story helps you explain the civil society, the, the policy makers, what are the problems. And the, the narrative can only come out from this very, the very interdisciplinary discourse. And I think that's the most beautiful part of this. That's why I, I would not support also the rage against, uh, um, uh, what was the name, Bill Nordhaus. Why is everybody so upset? He's the first economy who cared. He got the damage function completely wrong. He actually is very unfair to show the 2013 paper because he has papers that came out many, many years. And the 2023, for example, paper is a completely different story. But he tried to speak with climatologists. He's the first economist who sat down with climatologists and tried to think, OK, can we do something about that? He maybe, you know, it certainly did, came, did come out with wrong metric at the beginning. But the problem is that policymakers want to have a single damage function and that's going to be hit. How can you believe that there is a model that will produce numbers that are actually exact? Models are there to look at the future, to study, to explore, and ask questions. They're not there to give you the thing. So his answer was wrong. Too bad. He started to ask the right questions. And I think that's important, and that should be recognized. <laughs> With that, I conclude. And I Thank you. A big thank you for Valentina for making it very clear, uh, but not easier. 
and uh, economics always aren't that, but uh, that helps us to, to move on the path. Last but not least, uh, uh, Robert Constanza, professor from University College London. The floor is your a great, Thank grand, you. knowledge person in <laughs> environmental, social, and uh, economics fields. So we are very happy and pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Serpa, and thank you to the organizers, and this is an amazing uh, gathering. It's been called in a previous session uh, the Woodstock of Beyond Growth. So <laughs> um, I'm not an economist by training. Uh, my background is in systems ecology, looking at, uh, at, at the whole system. Uh, but during my PhD, um, they wanted me to take a, a language, and I convinced them to let me take economics instead. So I took economics as a foreign language. <laughs> and I think I got enough of it to get inoculated, but not quite enough to get the, uh, the full disease. So <clears throat> where are we? Uh, I had some slides. <laughs> Sorry? Were they the ones with the beautiful graphics? Uh, no, no. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay. Great. So, um, what comes beyond growth? Um, I think I would argue that it's sustainable well being. That's really what we're after. And, and how do we create that uh, sustainable well-being? Uh, I think it, it requires these three basic elements. First of all, we have to have an adequate vision uh, of how the world is, our, our scientific understanding. We heard about the planetary boundaries work. Uh, th there's been a lot of work recently in human psychology, what actually does contribute uh, to human well-being. I think we're learning a lot more about how the world actually does work, uh, our scientific understanding. I think it needs to be much more integrated, though, uh, to, to help us understand how this whole complex uh, inter, uh, interdependent system functions. Uh, but beyond that, I think we also need to have an adequate vision of how we would like the world to be. What are our goals for the future? Uh, and I think we've in, we need to build a truly shared and broad, broadly shared um, consensus and on, that, on those shared goals. And I think that's one of the missing elements here. I think we all in this room, um, I think, share uh, some of the goals about what sustainable well-being is. Uh, but I think the challenge is how do we broaden that, that, uh, uh, that vision? Uh, how do we bring uh, the rest of, or at least 30 percent of the, the planet, which is uh, said to be the tipping point, uh, to allow these changes to happen? How do we bring them on board? Um, I think one way to do that is to elaborate what that world would look like. Uh, what, what kind of world would that be? How, what would it be like to live in that world? Why would it be better uh, than, than the world, and much, much better than the world that we have now or in the world that we're headed toward? Uh, this session, though, is about um, modeling. Uh, so uh, what sort of tools and analysis do we need in order to um, achieve the, those goals? And I think we need much more systems thinking and modeling, uh, because we do live in a complex adaptive system, as we've heard uh, from many previous speakers. Um, and, and that's the kind of approach I think that we need. And, and the conventional economic models are not looking at the whole system. And finally, I think we need implementation strategies that are based on um, new kinds of institutions that can really deal with uh, the commons, our common assets, and not just our private, uh, private assets. And, I, and I'll argue... including things like common asset trusts, which I'll talk a little bit about if we have time. But, uh, but I also think we're going to need uh, societal therapy, because I think our fundamental problem is that we're addicted to the current system. We're locked into this, this system that we have now. <laughs> And you know, it's it's uh, we've been saying the same things that we've been we've heard in this room, uh, you know, for decades now. But why haven't we made more progress? Um, and so, uh, it's it's clear that you know, uh, simply confronting addicts with their problem and the solutions is often counterproductive. We need a, a more nuanced and a more um, positive kind of therapy, which I'll talk a little bit about if we get to that in the end. 
Um, before we start talking about models, um, I'll just remind you of this famous quote, if you, uh, that, that all models are wrong, uh, but some models are useful. Some models are more wrong than others, that's true. <laughs> But um, all models are wrong, even the models that we have in our heads, you know, the way we think about the world. Uh, they're at least incomplete, and they're just abstract and incomplete representations of a comp very complex reality. Uh, so we have to approach this all with a lot more uh, humility often than we, uh, than, we, than we tend to, and recognize the, the limitations of any abstract representation of reality, uh, but also look for the, those representations that are useful, uh, the ones that, that really do help us to achieve our, our shared goals that we've art articulated. Um, <clears throat> another way of saying this is the, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. We, we confuse the model with reality. We confuse the map you know, with the territory. We get so married uh, to, to our models or our ways of thinking of the world and our worldviews uh, that we can't, um, we can't differentiate them from, what, uh, from the more complex reality. Um, this is a little more complicated, but... <laughs> One of my first um, uh, interactions uh, with economists was reading this paper uh, by Herman Daly uh, back in 1968. Uh, he wrote a, a very elegant uh, paper uh, titled, you know, On Economics as a Life Science. And I think that's, that's part of the problem, that economics should be a life science, not, not, uh, not physics and chemistry, uh, but one that looks at the whole planet and the complex uh, interactions among, among the different parts. Um, this diagram just shows uh, the sort of conventional economic approach to modeling the, the, uh, the market economy, uh, sort of in, an input-output model at the center. Uh, but what Herman uh, said that, well, we need to expand those boundaries out to the boundaries of the planet and say, you know, uh, it's the, the economy really is everything uh, on the planet because uh, it's all interconnected. It all contributes uh, to our well-being in, in some way or another. Uh, so <clears throat> that was an, an early uh, attempt uh, to begin to create this much more integrated uh, approach uh, to modeling that, that planet. But just to go back a little bit, um, what's, what's the current vision or model of the macroeconomy? This is a, a simple caricature of that, uh, which shows the sort of uh, conventional uh, you know, factors of production, land, labor, and capital. Uh, but <clears throat> um, assuming that these factors are infinitely substitutable, and they, they uh, come together in the economic production process and produce uh, GDP, goods and services, marketed goods and services. Um, th these are things that occur in the private market or exchange for money. Uh, then they're either consumed or reinvested uh, to make more capital <clears throat> uh, to go into the future. And, and that our utility or welfare is, is mainly, uh, if not solely, a function of how much we consume. <clears throat> Did I get water? Okay, <clears throat> we know this model's wrong. How useful is it? <clears throat> well, it's, it's got some very uh, serious underlying premises, you know, that more is always better, uh, that, and that there's nothing in this model uh, that would uh, prevent it uh, from growing forever. Uh, so this idea of infinite economic growth has, has sort of underlined a lot of the economic policies built on this <clears throat> sort of uh, simplified vision um, of how the economy works. It also um, implies that you know, private property is really the best way to go because you're talking about uh, goods and services that are, that are private um, uh, kinds of goods and services, privatizable, uh, <clears throat> non-rival, uh, and excludable. And so why would you not try to privatize um, everything? Um, and nature is really a sideshow in this model because you know, we can substitute uh, labor and capital for, for natural resources and, uh, and the environment and continue to grow the economy indefinitely. Okay, so <clears throat> what's a more, uh, a better model for the new world, for the Anthropocene that we've heard about before, for the full world that we now live in? We have to recognize that uh, we live in a materially closed Earth system. Something, everything has to go somewhere. We cannot have you know, material growth of the economic subsystem uh, on a finite planet uh, indefinitely. That's just not gonna happen. It has to recognize that these four basic types of assets, uh, the conventional built capital, individual people, human capital, 
uh, our interactions with each other, our communities, our governance, our institutions, our social capital, and our natural capital, everything else in the world that we didn't have to produce, are all required uh, to produce conventional goods and services, um, and, but also to produce a whole range of other inputs and contributions to human well-being uh, that, are not, that are not marketed and, and should not be marketed. Uh, <clears throat> so, and that the, um, <clears throat> these are not substitutable uh, assets, or at least not very, not very far. Uh, so they're all required in some more balanced way in order to, to, uh, to produce these services optimally. Um, so how do we model this system in more quantitative ways, uh, like the integrated uh, assessment models uh, that uh, Valentina was talking about? Uh, well, there's a, there's a range, there's a whole spectrum uh, of different kinds of models of the economy that have been done so far. This is a, a, um, <clears throat> uh, a plot from a paper that uh, Dan O'Neill, who you heard from yesterday, uh, and, and his co-author uh, produced. And they've done a, a, a survey, an assessment of all of the ecological macroeconomic uh, models. Uh, that are out there, the ones that do try to incorporate um, not just the, the market economy, but the rest of the system uh, into this. Um, and they fall into a couple of categories. Uh, some are uh, the sort of expanded input-output models, some that include uh, physical inputs and outputs. Uh, but I think the, the ones I want to emphasize are the systems dynamics uh, models, uh, the ones that actually do look at the way stocks and flows in the system change uh, over time and how we understand the, the feed, complex feedbacks in those systems and, and how, they, uh, how, they, how they affect uh, all of the things that are important to us, including our sustainable well-being. Now, you've, who's, who's, ever, who, who's read this book, The Limits to Growth, in this audience? That's a pretty, that's a pretty good fraction. You know, it came out in 1972. I think it sold, what? Uh, 10 million or more copies. <clears throat> so who, who would have thought that a book about a systems dynamics model of the planet you know, would sell that many copies? But uh, this is actually what it, what it looks like uh, if you break it down uh, <clears throat> into this uh, Stella sort of simulation modeling language. Uh, so it includes you know, a range of different variables, I think on the order of, of uh, 40 or so. Uh, but, but it also looks at how those things change over time. And they were quite uh, ambitious in trying to build a model that started in 1900 and ran all the way through uh, 2100, you know, two, two centuries. Like, who had ever done that before in 1972? Nobody was, was even close uh, to, to producing that kind of integrated, dynamic assessment of how this global, you know, global system worked. They were way out there in, in, front of, uh, in front of everyone else. Of course, it was, it was lambasted, um, particularly by the economics profession, uh, because <clears throat> it didn't have prices. You know, they were predicting a collapse. You know, they were not showing that the economy could grow forever, essentially. Uh, so <laughs> it must have been wrong. Um, in fact, these, these are the um, comparison between the projections of that model and what actually happened. Uh, so it you know, made projections in 1972 out to 2100, and it was predicting that you know, in, in about 2030, we're, they were, this is the business as usual scenario. The other important thing about this is that this was not the only scenario that they produced. They produced a whole range of scenarios, including ones uh, that showed how we could stabilize the system, how we could create a steady state economy, um, and the kinds of changes that we could have made you know, back much earlier um, that, that, that would have gotten us to a place of sustainable well-being, uh, you know, uh, about, about now. So <clears throat> um, to carry on with that tradition, uh, this is the 50th anniversary plus one of the, uh, the Limits to Growth model um, by the Club of Rome. And uh, in the, the fifth, for the 50th anniversary, this, this model was not just updated, but, but sort of recreated and expanded and, and uh, built, built on uh, to create the, uh, this, this new model, uh, which you can download and take a look at and, and play with on your, uh, you know, on your laptops going forward. <clears throat> so that tradition goes on. Some of the differences uh, in, the, in the new version uh, are that they included uh, well-being explicitly uh, as a variable in the, in the model. Uh, and they included a whole range of other, of other factors. 
again, you know, this is not um, a complete picture uh, of everything that's going on in the, in the, in the world, but that is the, the essential art of, of modeling. How do you produce a, a, a representation, an abstract representation of the system um, that, that, that is useful, that's useful in terms of trying to understand this complex system, trying to make projections uh, into the future about, about how things might, might occur. And to do that, it gets complicated, um, but not so complicated that you can't uh, begin to understand that, particularly if you can go, and, go in and play with the model uh, yourself. Uh, one other model that I'll, that I'll mention is this one by Peter Victor and, um, and Tim Jackson is actually working on a, uh, um, a newer version of this, uh, what's called the low-grow uh, model. Um, and this was a model of the Canadian economy which was explicitly built um, sort of as a, as a macroeconomic model or, or as, as close to that as possible, but including uh, many of the other factors that, that, uh, that were necessary. And they were able to show that, you know, if you just shut off GDP, uh, that you, would, you could produce a no growth uh, disaster. But with the appropriate policy changes, uh, you could also produce a low or no growth um, uh, version of the Canadian economy that could go off into, into city states. So gee, it's a, essentially uh, an existence proof uh, that you do not need, even in a complex economy like Canada, uh, you don't have to have GDP growth uh, to have a, 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 a viable uh, economic system uh, that produces uh, all of the benefits that we've been talking about. So, um, just re-remind you, though, that all models are wrong. Uh, but I think some of these systems dynamics kinds of models, uh, ones that can actually incorporate uh, the complexity and of, the, of the, the whole system, and we're certainly getting much better at, at doing that as we learn more about how that system functions and if we have, as we have much better uh, data going forward about how, how it works. Um, we, we can uh, begin to create <clears throat> models that, that really are useful uh, to help us get to our, our goal, uh, our final goal of a sustainable well-being future. What sort of indicators uh, do we need to attach to these models? Because I think the, the, uh, uh, that's the other connection, especially with this, with this conference, uh, that these models can, can be connected with uh, different indicators uh, of well-being. And I think one of the, the reasons that GDP has been so resilient uh, to change uh, is that it has this underlying system of national accounts uh, you know, uh, behind it. Uh, what we need, I think, going forward is a much more uh, comprehensive system dynamics model uh, to complement and replace that static system of accounts. Uh, one that has uh, you know, a, the, uh, the appropriate set of, of indicators built into it so that we can look at not only how those things changed in the past, where they are in the future, but how they might change, uh, I mean, where they are in the present, uh, but also how they might change um, into the future under different policy uh, constraints. Um, we also need, I think we're at, at the point now, uh, as we've said in, in one of our previous sessions, that there's been enough experimentation with different uh, indicators of well-being and sustainability uh, that, that we can now get to the point of building a broad consensus on what those, um, what those appropriate indicators are. Uh, so I think that's, that's the challenge that we're facing uh, at the moment. And I think con connecting that uh, with a better system dynamics understanding of the system will also help. Um, we can also employ a much broader range of data sources uh, than we have ever in the past, and I think the integrated assessment models have started to do that, uh, but we don't, don't have to be stuck with the kinds of data uh, that we know how to collect. Uh, what we really should do is start to figure out what do we want to measure and figure out ways that, that, uh, that we might be able to go forward and, and to measure that. So. But what's holding us back you know, to create this sustainable well-being economy? Uh, what, what, what do we have to do? Um, and I would argue that uh, fundamentally we have to break our addiction to this growth at all costs economic paradigm, uh, to fossil fuels, to overconsumption in, in high-income countries, uh, to all of the things that are keeping, uh, that are reinforcing in the system uh, and, that, and that are hard to, uh, hard to break out of. 
uh, you know, we've been, as I said, um, making these same assessments and proposing the same solutions for decades, but we haven't, haven't made much progress uh, in, in overcoming this addiction. That means it's going to take uh, some kind of therapy, and it turns out that, you know, what, uh, what works at the individual scale uh, to overcome addictions is not confronting addicts with their, uh, with their uh, problems. Uh, that's often counterproductive. Uh, it's, but one therapy that works is, is based on um, establishing a, a, the, the life goals of the individual. What kind of life do they want to achieve? And using that <clears throat> um, uh, uh, to help motivate the kinds of the difficult changes uh, that are necessary to overcome addictions. And I think it's the same process that we could use at the um, societal scale. How do we create that shared vision of where we all want to go? Uh, I don't think we've spent enough time and effort uh, you know, trying to do that. And I think we, there are some, some unique challenges uh, to doing that. But there are also some unique opportunities uh, out there uh, you know, with, with the internet, the ability to communicate with everyone on Earth. You know, the sustainable development goals are clearly a step in that direction of creating a global shared vision. Uh, but I think we could do much more than that. And, and ultimately, I think it's going to take a movement uh, to order, in order to implement uh, that vision. Once we have that shared vision, once it becomes uh, clear enough and that that's the kind of world that we want, uh, then I think that can help to motivate the, the difficult political changes to overcome you know, the fossil fuel uh, lobby, to overcome um, many of the, the uh, kinds of lock-in uh, um, uh, addictions that we, that we have in, in, uh, in society today. Bob, I so, hate I'm to done. Yeah. interrupt you, so, but could you please wrap in yeah. one minute? This is my last slide. I'll just put up some, uh, some recent books that go into more detail on all of this. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bob, uh, for your presentation. And one of the, um, out of the many important messages what you had is that learn to measure what you want. And I would add there, what you do not want, not only what you've used to measure and what is available and, and easy. And then, of course, uh, one of my favorites is the system thinking and modeling. And another thing that everybody should learn after uh, uh, adding and minus uh, in, in mathematics in, in, in school. Once again, a uh, great thank to our uh, uh, panelists. And one question that I would like to ask you a quick comment, because I think that we all here can agree that the, the GDP is uh, not a good measure. It is actually a very perversive measure uh, if we look what it uh, actually delivers to, to us as natural capital and, and human well-being. We can agree uh, that uh, there's a lot of data, right, already, and measurements. The only point is how to get them on board, to agree how to harmonize, standardize them. And uh, we can agree that uh, there's quite a rush to do that we can't wait 100 years. It's more or less like five, five years that we have the time. And we agree that we need to change the economic modeling like uh, Gail very uh, well and the rest of you have shown. So my last question uh, for all of you would be, what is then the role of uh, universities, science, institutions, and then the politics? So what do you think that uh, the, the science, the knowledge people like you could and should do to engage the civil society and politicians? Because I can't do a remodeling of any kind. And uh, then uh, what are your expectations to us politicians what needs to happen in regulatory level to, to facilitate this uh, process? And uh, Anne, would you like to start? Um, yes, I've got my head. So, <clears throat> I just want, I think it's really important, you'll, I, could, I think I can deal with the last part of your question, which is, what is the role for politicians? And I think the role for politicians on, the, on our side of the spectrum, so to speak, is to understand our power. 
You know, I, I, it's, and also think about it as power, because we have power, but we, it's unused. You know, Wall Street knows how to use public infrastructure. We don't know how to say, sorry, these are the terms and conditions. I personally wasn't against the bailout of the banks in 2008-9. What I was against was that it was done unconditionally, and the politicians have to lose their or, if you like, the, the, the way in which they sort of genuflect to, the, to the, these financial institutions and say, sorry, no, you know, we want terms and conditions for bailouts. Uh, if you want to use our assets, if you want to use our resources, public resources, taxpayer back resources, these are the terms and conditions. So we'd just like our politicians to have a bit more spine or backbone, if you like, when it Got comes to dealing with them. Thank you. And Gail, uh, what would be your answer? So my answer would be twofold. First, regarding universities, I would say what we need today is not a university, but a pluriversity. That is a place where we really can have an open discussion about alternatives. So, so I definitely agree that Bill Nodos has played a big role, and that's absolutely beautiful. But we definitely also need today to have other voices showing that, well, the situation might be much more serious than he believed during years. So that would be the role of a pluriversity as opposed to a university, which is an inheritance from the Middle Age. And regarding, regarding politicians, I would go exactly in the same direction of, of Anne. So let me just give you an example. If you have understood as a politician that money is more neutral and that there is money creation, then you can think in the European system, why is the European Central Bank independent from the political power? So as a politician, you should question that and say, well, maybe this was a mistake. You know, the sacrosanct independence of the central bank makes no sense once we understand that money has an impact on fiscal policy and vice versa. And then you could also say, why not put into practice a QE for people or a quantitative easing for green investments, for a green new deal at the European level? Then you might even ask, go as far as saying, couldn't we cancel the public debts which is held at the balance sheet of the ECB? Or even you could say, could the ECB purchase some fossil fuel assets on the balance sheet of commercial banks and play the role of the bad bank? Because we know that sooner or later, people will suggest to create bad banks that will do exactly the same job as they did in 2009, that is to buy fossil fuel assets in order to save our commercial banks from a disaster. Um, and then these are the big questions that politicians could ask once they really have understood that money matters, matter matters, energy matters. Thank you, Gail. And then to Valentina, what is your advice? So I started teaching uh, climate change economics uh, 10 years ago, and I had 10 students. I am in a mainstream economics university. Now I have a plus, 100 plus, uh, and I have multiple courses. And so I'm very optimistic about uh, the new generation. I'm very pessimistic about uh, the older generation. Last three years I have an I experienced the private sector, and I was, uh, you know, uh, I was shocked by the level of knowledge that young engineers have in in a big energy company. Really, they know everything about climate change. They, they you know, they think about infrastructure by thinking ahead uh, and looking at climate projections. So that wasn't the problem. The problem is all the, you know, public people working in the public sector, policymakers, etc. They are, I come from Italy, they are very old. So they didn't learn any, any of this at school. They have no idea, zero. So I would, I would talk about the two-degree target. They have no idea of, I mean, they say two-degree target because it's written, but they have no idea what that means, 2%, 2, minus 2, minus 2 of what. So complete ignorance. And, and that, I don't know how to change that. I, in a country with very old people in power, that we, uh, the only thing, ways that younger people vote them down, but in my country they don't. There, all the young people and other activists, you hear it. Plus then, join the parties, the one that is closest to you, 
or than some of the conservative parties. You know, if all these 10,000 people that have been attending this conference would recruit five of their friends, and then all over the, our member states would take over the conservative parties. <laughs> wow, would I have friends! And actually, the political structure isn't that powerful and big when it comes to, to membership. And if people really would take that hardship to come in to battle and debate with the old card <laughs> and be voting on, on party congresses about the programs and prime ministers and with whom you go to government or whatever, that makes the trick. So please. Then, uh, last but not least, uh, Robert, uh, back to you and your uh, comments. Well, I think university, universities have traditionally you know, been the source of social change, and I think it can happen again. Um, but I think we also need to change the way we're, we're, uh, we're, we're handling teaching in universities. Uh, that we need much more engaged, you know, education, much more uh, sort of problem focused. And I think if we could have, you know, students and politicians and, and business leaders working together to solve problems rather than simply lecturing at, at students and telling them what we already know, you know, how do we get them in the classroom uh, working together with other stakeholders to, to discover new, new solutions and new, new ways to go. Uh, and also to, to change the, uh, you know, the, the, the age and gender dynamics and the uh, in the classroom and the power power dynamic. So uh, this whole idea of learning by doing and you know problem based learning, I think we could do a lot more with that uh, to to push this agenda forward. Uh, and it also I think is going to take it's going to take a movement. It's going to take you know uh, political change uh, at some level, and that has to be driven by you know this vision. What what does this world look like? And make it clear that we're not talking about people sacrificing, you know, to get to this world. We're talking about an improvement in people's quality of life, uh, and in uh, in many many ways. And I think the, uh, the the psychological research sort of backs that up uh, quite clearly, uh, you know. That but that is not known to most people. Most people think they have to continue to consume, and and uh, that's the only path to happiness. Uh, but it's obviously not. Thank you, Robert. I see different kind of international hand signs from the organizers, so unfortunately we do not have time for questions from the audience, but it's totally my fault, not the panel and not the organizers, so I take it. And very briefly, a thousand th thanks to, to our wonderful panelists and uh, wonderful audience, you made it. Thank you. <laughs>